In an organisation, it is the duty of the leader to protect their followers. But what is the duty of an individual in the wide world? Frank Henner held that there were four basic requirements of ethics. Avoid evil, prevent evil, remove evil and do good. Grace and Cohen note that concern for others extends our minimum ethical obligation to the prevention of harm and protection of our followers. Effective leadership requires not only that we stand up for what we believe in, but also that we stand behind our followers when they stand up for the values you have espoused to them. In other words, we have a duty to protect our followers when they stand up for what is ethically right. Whistleblowing represents a specific instance where this may become necessary. Nier and Maselli define whistleblowing as the disclosure by organisation members, former or current, of illegal, immoral or illegitimate practices under the control of their employees to persons or organisations that may be able to affect action. It can be argued that this reporting is to bodies external to the organisation and that all internal mechanisms for resolving the issue have been exhausted. Unfortunately, there is a history that in most organisations, whistleblowers often suffer adverse consequences for their actions. If we as leaders are to uphold ethical values, then there needs to be protections afforded to those who are prepared to stand by those values. Of course, whistleblowing is not just the province of followers. It is often the case that leaders are privileged with information that followers are not, or are able to see deeper into the organisation than followers, and are therefore possibly more likely to witness unethical or illegal conduct. This was the case with Thomas Drake, former senior executive of the NSA, who was the whistleblower of the NSA's disastrous trailblazer project. Peter Rost was a former VP of Wyeth Pharmaceuticals and sued his employer when he discovered their tax evasion practices. Geoffrey Wigand, former Vice President of Research and Development at Brown and Williamson Tobacco and upon whom the Michael Mann film, The Insider, is based. As Nir and Micelli highlight in their model of effective whistleblowing, the phenomena is complex and involves individual variables from characteristics of the whistleblower to characteristics of the complaint recipient and the wrongdoer to situational variables such as characteristics of the wrongdoing and characteristics of the organisation. It is for this reason that the whistleblower needs to understand when whistleblowing is appropriate. They need to recognise that there is potentially a high degree of personal risk involved and therefore dependent upon that level of risk versus the likely outcome of not undertaking the risk that the individual whom the leader is backing or the leader themselves must consider the following concerns put forward by Grace and Cohen. The matter must be serious, imminent and specific and there should be evidence of its seriousness. Revelation of the information must be of public benefit and the public must have a right to know and should not be mischievous or malicious. Less damaging ways of rectifying the problem, such as internal procedures, must be unavailable to the whistleblower. If other avenues were available to the whistleblower, these should have been tried. Blowing the whistle is likely to remedy the problem. It is critical that a leader take into account the risks that they or their follower are facing in making a decision. As such, Many scholars of ethics and whistleblowing, such as Bowie and Dusker, note that it is the right of an employee to whistleblow, but rarely an obligation. In either case, Grace and Cohen suggest that the means employed to whistleblow should be proportional to the seriousness of the issue and the appropriate outcome. From the perspective of the whistleblower, Weston and Webster, as summarised by Grace and Cohen, provide the following advice to potential whistleblowers. Verify the sufficiency of your evidence. Ensure you are objecting to illegal or unethical conduct. Discuss your plan of actions with trusted others as they will be affected by what you do. Exhaust all organisational processes and procedures for dealing with complaints or objections. Consider whether it is better to act publicly or anonymously. Keep the objection confined to those who need to deal with it and remain civil. Document every action that you take. Recognise that your right of public discussion may be limited by contract or defamation laws, for example. Appreciate that going public will have some personal ramifications. From the perspective of organisational leadership, we want to provide an environment that avoids the need for external whistleblowing in the first place, but nonetheless encourages and supports genuine whistleblowing if that fails. 
Saharidu reports that while studies into the understanding of effective mechanisms to enact these two goals are ongoing, research shows that the following should be in place as a minimum. Codes of ethics and conduct. Policies that afford genuine protection for whistleblowers. Clear and mandatory mechanisms for reporting serious unethical and illegal behaviour. Clear chains to escalate matters that are not resolved and which end with an external reporting authority with power over the organisation. The ability of the whistleblower to remain anonymous. Processes for reporting upon the success of whistleblowing in achieving positive legal and ethical outcomes. It is the duty of a leader to protect and support their followers in applying and maintaining organisational values and ethics. Whistleblowing represents a specific instance and a manifest way of building and supporting a positive moral culture.